Let me um, just begin by noting our co-sponsor today, Columbia's Institute for the Study of Human Rights at our School of International and Public Affairs. And I want to thank SEPA Professor Elazar Barkin, who directs the Institute, and David Phillips, who leads its program on peace building and human rights. I also want to recognize and thank our moderator today, NBC News correspondent Ann Curry, a great broadcast journalist who has managed to carve out her own unique beat, working to make sure that American viewers are informed about issues of poverty and human rights around the world. In the decade since we instituted the World Leaders Forum, no event has been more notable or more welcomed than the one we have today. In every era, there seems to be a few individuals who rise within their countries to stand for a better life for their fellow citizens and for lives founded on basic principles like government by the consent of the governed and respect for the rights and dignity of every person. And in doing this and by suffering themselves for others, these unique individuals transcend their national boundaries and become emblematic of the strivings of human beings everywhere. Dong San Suu Kyi is such an individual, and we proudly welcome her to Colombia today. Throughout Colombia's long 258-year-old history, the university has studied and stood for basic human freedoms, freedoms of thought and action, peace and security, good health, and meaningful citizenship. This has been represented in our faculty, our students, our schools, our institutes and centers, and our alumni, our library collections, our visitors and guests, and our forums like the historic one today. It is a rich and proud history. But there is just one instance I would like to draw on this afternoon because of its relevance to our speaker. Six years ago, we welcomed into our community for a long residency another brave citizen of his country and of the world who emerged from his own years as a prisoner of conscience into a position of national and global leadership, the late president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel. Havel gave us a remarkable semester of lectures, performances, and opportunities to study his work as both a playwright and a political leader. And over the last decade of his life, President Havel had no greater cause than winning the freedom of his spiritual cellmate under house arrest in Burma, Dasu. Havel wrote this in the Washington Post on the occasion of Dasu's 60th birthday, which he observed in a Buddhist culture marks an important milestone in one's life. He said, I would like to meet her and give her a rose, like the one she is seen holding in the photograph in my study. Such an ordinary wish, however, in the case of such an extraordinary woman as Aung San Suu Kyi, may seem a silly idea. The current situation is, in Burma is bad, he continued, but I am still an optimist. Seemingly unshakable totalitarian monoliths are in fact sometimes as cohesive as proverbial houses of cards and fall just as quickly. Continuing democratization of the whole region together with growing dissent inside the country must eventually have a positive effect. As Aung San Suu Kyi celebrates her 60th birthday, I wish for her that those changes will happen as soon as possible, and that my silly idea to hand her a rose becomes a simple and easy thing to do. Dasu, 
Havel understood so well that you provided hope to oppressed people, not only in your own country, but around the globe, demonstrating how to endure both physical isolation and personal hardship by keeping one's eyes and heart firmly and optimistically fixed on what others may see as an unreachable horizon, sustained by the knowledge that democratic change is not only possible, but inevitable when enough people finally choose to make it so. Already on your historic tour of the United States, you've met with President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. You were honored with a gold medal by the U.S. Congress, and of course you have been justly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. But let me celebrate the recent progress in your, own, in your home country and welcome you to Colombia by following Havel's wish and by doing that simple and now easy thing to do that was unjustly forbidden to our great mutual friend. Welcome to Colombia. So um, thank you so much, President Bollinger, for some beautiful remarks and for the presentation that I know is well received. Um, I want to first, before we begin, I want to tell you, first of all, how lucky, as you well know, we all are, even beyond what you might imagine. Because I understand, and you don't know this yet, but the registration for this event took 34 minutes before it was closed. And that is a first for the history of this university. So everyone here really wanted to see you today. And the person I would like to stand to thank for this opportunity, um, um, because he helped make today possible, uh, he has worked to support Burma's transition uh, toward openness. He is also the director of the program on peace building and human rights. And it, we just heard his name mentioned by President Bollinger. Please stand, David Phillips, to be applauded. So as we are in the company uh, of someone, of a human being who lifts us all and who for about 15 of 21 years was shut away so that she would not be heard. Let us not waste another second to hear her opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Aung San Suu Kyi. Thank you. Thank you for giving me such a warm welcome. I would just like to say a few words to explain why I want to meet young people everywhere I go. These days you will have heard of the resources curse, the kind of natural resources that make it possible for a government not to be accountable to its people, the kind of resources curse with which we had to put up in Burma because the military regime could survive for a long time without support from its people or even from the rest of the world because of the natural resources that they were able to exploit. Now, when people talk about resources curse, of course, they're thinking of gas and oil and minerals and so on. But we all forget that the most precious resource of any country is its human resource. And the reason why I like to meet young people and to hear from them and to exchange views from them is because we don't want that resource in our country to turn into a curse. Young people who are ill-educated, young people who are in ill health, and young people who have become, who have lost, lost hope because they have no work, these people are a danger to the country. They will create unrest because there will be simmering resentment against a world which had produced them and failed to provide for them and failed to make them capable of providing for others. So that we might not have this human resource curse come to our country as a scourge and to other places 
in this world. I like to engage with young people to see what it is that will make them able to face the challenges of the future, to see how we can help our young people in Burma who have suffered so badly from a poor education system that many of them are unemployed and not fit to take up any kind of employment. This is why I always appeal to potential donors, to those who wish to help Burma, not only to create jobs, but also to provide our young people with the kind of training that will enable them to take up the jobs that have been created. So I was asked only this morning, why young people? And this is why, because you are our present as well as our future, and you should be our treasure and uh, our joy rather than our curse. And if you become our curse, it's because of us who have failed to provide you with a situation in which you could realize your potential and go on to help others realize their potential. So this is why I'm here today, to hear from you, to exchange views from you, and to learn from you how I can best help the young people of my country who have not had the advantages that you have had, but who nevertheless deserve much better than they have today. Thank you. So in a few moments, uh, we will ask you to offer your advice to Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, uh, there are microphones uh, uh, to the right and to the left of me, and, and um, in a few moments, I'll ask you to line up there. But before we um, get the answers you seek from America's youth, um, you said, you have said that in captivity, you were not always thinking of hope. You were always thinking, despite all of these years, of what to do next. What allowed you to stay focused on freedom for your people? I think uh, I am a focused sort of person. Uh, my approach to life I have once described as my reaction to a uh, uh, pressure cooker blowing off. I, this happened to me actually, in, in <laughs> fact. I was cooking and the, uh, I was not looking at the pressure cooker very carefully. So, do we still have pressure cookers? Yeah, we do. Oh, yes. A few, not very well, many. I, I don't know but. what kind of developments there have been over the last uh, couple of decades. I can't <laughs> keep up with every one of them. And anyway, the pressure cooker exploded because I wasn't watching it carefully. And everything went all over the room. And for a Second, I felt panic, and then I thought, no, let's see what we do next. Okay, we turn off the gas, and then uh, you know, we have to take a sponge, and then we mop up the mess, and so on and so on. So I took it one step at a time, and that calmed me down. And that was a lesson. I decided that whenever there's a crisis to be met, then you just do what you can, one step at a time, and you think yourself through it, this is what I'm going to do first, then this comes next, and after that the third step is this, and so on. And then it becomes very easy, and you calm down. And this is how I approached all the crises of my life uh, during, under house arrest. I can't really say that there were too many crises, because um, there's not much you can get up to if you're under house arrest. <laughs> but. I did take everything very calmly in a very practical way, step by step. I stuck to a very strict timetable because that also kept me disciplined and prevented me from wasting my time under house arrest. One of the things I did feel very strongly was, all right, they've placed me under, under house arrest. I'm not going to give them the satisfaction of knowing that I've become less disciplined and that I've dissipated those years under detention. So I tried to get as much out of those years as I could get. I meditated, I read, I listened to the radio, I exercised. I think I was the healthiest prisoner of conscience in the world. <laughs> Prisoners of conscience. 
even so, often are influenced by those they, whose works they read or those who they've met. Who would you say have been your greatest uh, sources of influence in keeping yourself disciplined as you moved ahead towards your cause? First of all, my father, because I look for my father, not just as my father, but as uh, my political mentor. I had been reading his, um, his speeches and his writings. There were not too many that, uh, it was not a great body of writing because he was very young when he died. He was uh, 32 years and a few months. So he had, a, and he had led a very, very active life, and so there had not been that much time for him to uh, write long books. But he had written a certain amount, all about politics, of course, and uh, he had made uh, quite a number of speeches which had been collected together. So I had studied these, and f uh, they had influenced me. They influenced me a great deal. And then there was also Jawaharlal Nehru because he had been a personal friend of my father and the Indian independence movement had taken place at the same time as the Burmese independence movement and there, was a very, there were very close links between the leaders of the two countries. And then there was Václav Havel. I'm very glad the president mentioned him because my, uh, during w one of the rare visits that my family were able to make to me, they brought me his books. And so I read his books. I felt very close to him. And he, he was so very supportive. And I must uh, take up the story of the rose because he said that he wanted to give me a rose about a couple of months ago when a Czech delegation came to see me at the new, new uh, capital in Burma where I was attending the National Assembly. They brought me a rose that had been placed on um, uh, Vac Vacaf Havel's coffin at the time of his funeral. And they remembered that he had wanted to give me a rose. So this rose was beautifully preserved uh, in, in a sort of perspex case. And they did, he did manage to give me a rose. So those were my influences. My father, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Gandhi. Gandhi? Uh, of course, Gandhi's writings. Uh, in some ways, I have to say, I felt a little bit closer to Nehru because I think uh, our education pattern was um, more similar. We, we had been educated in England and we had had the same kind of intellectual background. Uh, Gandhi, is, Gandhi is somebody really phenomenal. I think you must all read his works. I think the more you, you read Gandhi, the more impressed you are by who he was and what he was. You must remember that change through nonviolent means was not ever thought of before Gandhi. He was the one who started it. He was the one who decided that it was possible to bring about revolutionary change without violence. We know that Gandhi inspired Martin Luther King. Now you inspire. So what is the message above all to those who will look to you as you have looked to Nehru and Gandhi and President Havel and your father? What is the message you would want young people to take away from your experiences? Uh, that Principles are not an old-fashioned idea. Principles matter. You have to build your life on principles. You have to build your life on a sense of duty. These are not old-fashioned ideas. If you build your life on a sense of duty, on principles, you will find that you are that much ab better able to meet the challenges that life will throw at you. It's bound to. And one of the best things about leaving a principled, duty-conscious life is that you learn to take responsibility for your own actions and not to keep blaming others for whatever happens to you. Now, 
this is not just in, pri in one's private life. One of the big weaknesses of the previous military regime was that they blamed others for, for whatever went wrong in the country. We had gained our independence in 1948. Still, the regime was blaming the colonial administration for the ills of the country. They never once blamed themselves. Everything was due to what the colonial government had done way back in the past. And that contrasted uh, strongly with what was happening at that time, for example, in Vietnam, when the Vietnamese government, although a communist government, had been engaging with the United States and forgetting the bitterness of the fighting that had gone on in their country so terribly for so long. At the time when, the, when Vietnam and the United States had started to engage, the Burmese military regime was still busy blaming the British colonial government. They just would not take responsibility for their own actions. So Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Václav Havel, they all were people of principle. Václav Havel's living in truth means just that, that. You have to be true to your principles, to your beliefs, to the cause in which you believe. And in doing so, on your own part, one might argue that you have gone a long way towards what you wish for your country. You have said it is not done yet. You are still on the way. What is the Burma, Myanmar, also known as Burma, what is the Burma you envision? I have known a different Burma because when we became independent in 1948, we became independent as a parliamentary democracy. And I can always remember that when I was a child, there were many newspapers which came out every day. And we received, um, or we took in, I don't think we actually took them, and they were probably given to us uh, by, uh, by the publishers because they were friends of my family. So there were always three, four, five newspapers around the house representing different points of views. There was a pro-government -gov newspaper, there was an anti-government newspaper. Uh, in those da days, days, there were communist insurgencies, and then there were those newspapers which were leftist, although, of course, they couldn't support the communist insurgents as such. And I would hear the adults reading out articles to one another. I was not old enough to read properly then, but I, I, could, I would hear them reading articles in the newspapers, editorials, some of which must have been uh, very witty because they would laugh and they would uh, uh, discuss these uh, editorials. And then, later, when the military regime took over in 1962, all this change. Oh, I also have to mention another a, a very interesting experience. Um, during my early, uh, during the years of my childhood, there were many insurgencies in Burma, including the Karen insurgency. And a friend of our family, who was, the, uh, who was a Karen minister in the government, was arrested and jailed because he was accused of having um, made contacts with the insurgents. Uh, of course, as he was put into prison and he had lost his job as minister, his family had to vacate the official home. And they came to stay with us. And nobody thought this was strange. This is not anything to worry about. We were just having friends to stay and everybody thought it the, it the most natural thing in the world that my mother should have allowed her friends to come and stay with us. Then it seemed perfectly natural. But after the military takeover, such a move would have been highly dangerous, taking in the family of a man who had been put in prison, accused of working against the government. And after the military regime came into power, free newspapers became a thing of the past. 
and gradually people became more and more afraid to speak their minds. There was fear everywhere. And this contrasted so strongly from what I remembered of my childhood that when I think of the future of Burma, it will include some of the good things we had in the past. But of course, we must move on with the times. One question that m many have asked you already today, leading up to this conversation, is what was it? Was there one thing more than anything else that convinced the government, the dictatorship of Myanmar, also known as Burma, to agree to open a little by little, to let you out of that house? Well, I think I was let out because the elections were over. Uh, I think I was kept in. I should have been freed in, let me see, I've got to work it out, <laughs> um, 2009, I think. No, 2008. No, I was freed in 10, but I should have been freed in 2009. But they were planning elections for 2010. I think uh, most of the people here may perhaps have heard of the uh, American who came swimming into my garden and uh, he and, and because I wouldn't I did not hand him over to the police I did not hand him over to the authorities as a matter of principle there was no rule of law in our country and all our people who were arrested because of the political uh, activities were denied proper justice. And as a matter of principle, I felt I could not hand over anybody to, into the hands of those who would not give him the justice that was the due of every human being. So because of that, they brought up a case against me. Uh, uh, it was very interesting. My detention order says that I should not write uh, to people outside. Now this was in Burmese. It's a little bit difficult to explain, but um, we don't have, we don't say we communicate with people. We say we communicate to or people communicate from. And so my lawyers and uh, the, this gentleman had brought a letter from his young daughter and uh, the government um, uh, attorney said that I had broken the terms of the detention by accepting this letter and my lawyers pointed out that it, uh, under the detention order I was not supposed to write to somebody outside there was nothing about my receiving uh, a communication uh, from outsiders but uh, they followed a conv convoluted argument whereby to and from meant exactly the same. And therefore, I w my uh, detention was extended. Instead of being freed in 2009, I was kept in until 2010. And I think specifically to keep me in until after the elections, which were meant to place the, uh, the party of the army, the USDP, firmly at the helm, which it did because that party won over 80% of the seats. But what was it that caused the government, the dictatorship, to open up? What more than anything? I think, think it was the economic mess the country was in, and uh, they felt the need to do something about it, and they began to understand that they couldn't cope on their own. You have said, because now you're a politician, and like, because you're a member of parliament now, and that you would never say that you would never run for president of your country. Can you tell us how soon that might well, be? Well, actually, the, uh, the president is not uh, elected directly. It's elected by the legislature. Okay. So. Uh, depends on how soon the leg legislature becomes free and independent. <laughs> that, that means changing their constitution. Spoken like a politician. <laughs> I'm going to ask um, all of you, because I don't want to 
um, have Dao Si Su Chi um, feel that she did not get your advice on how to help young people and also that she didn't get a chance to hear your questions, which is really why we're here today. There are no stupid questions, but I hope that you will feel free to step up to these microphones and begin to line up when you're ready to, to ask some questions. Um, but she is here really um, not to hear my questions, but to hear yours. The first person who reached the mic is over here to my left. Please say your name, who you're affiliated with, and please, because there are so many, obviously there are a lot of questions, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, that, that you keep your questions brief. I'm Lou Kellum. I am a uh, high school visiting student here. And uh, yeah. as a 15-year-old still in high school, how can I s help people in Burma struggle for democracy? Should I tell about your country's struggle to my friends? Should I write to, my, to congressmen? Should I donate money to organizations? To help, or should I help Burmese refugees here? Or what should I do? Thank well, I do think you really need to write to your congressman because Congress is firmly behind the Burmese uh, democracy movement. But all the other three you could do. And, that, and you would help us a lot. Uh, by doing those, but I'm very interested in the fact that you're a visiting high school student. We have no programs like this in our country. The, what I would li really like you to do is to come to visit Burma and find out for yourself what our schools are like, what our universities are like, and then I think you'll get a better idea of how you might be able to help us. And I would like you to engage with our young people this is why I would like you to come to Burma. Bring a group of your friends and get in touch with us and we'll make arrangements for you to look around some of the schools. You're a hero to many of my friends and they'll be very happy to hear that I spoke to you. Thank, Thank you. you. This is your opportunity. Your name, affiliation, and please keep your question brief. Ming Lava. Uh, my name is Justin Nye. I'm a second year master's student uh, at Columbia University. School of Social Work. Um, I was born and raised in Burma and I came here six years ago. And my question is, before I ask my question, my goal is, my ultimate goal is to work for the people. My passion, first of all, I'm, so, I'm sorry, this is the most remarkable moment in my life to see this. I'm very excited. I cried already. So um, my passion is to work for the people of Burma and I'm studying international social welfare services to refugees and immigrants. I'm primarily working with Burmese refugees. If there will be any chance to work with you on issues regarding social work after my graduation. <laughs> well, why not? There'll be so much to be done. And, uh, all I can say is keep in touch. And what we'll do towards the end of the program is to give you the email of the NLD headquarters. And you can keep in touch with us through that address. And thank you very much for thinking of going back and helping our people. And good luck with your studies. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Sibo. I am a junior in Columbia College. Um, so my question is, a, a few days ago, you indicated that your visit to the United States should not be in any way seen as a hostile step toward China. So my question is, if the NLD were to become the ruling party in Burma, what changes, if any, would you make uh, in Sino-Burmese relations? We used to have very good relations with China. Now the difference now is that although the relations between the governments remain good, people to people relations are not as good as they used to be. This has more to do with Chinese businesses in Burma than with the government to government relationship. Uh, many people in our country feel that Chinese businessmen in Burma do not care for our country and our people, that they're only there for the sake of their own profits. So I would like to change this. I would, want, I would like better people-to-people -people 
relations. We would like our people to get to know one another, not just as businessmen and their clients, but as, say, students to students, housewives to housewives, people to people. That is what I would like to see, the re-establishment of friendly relations between the peoples. Between the governments, we've always had um, a policy of good relations with our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please feel free. Uh, my name is Dana Waters. I'm a first year student at uh, the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And if I stumble over words, I'm sorry, I don't get a lot of chances to speak to Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> That's all right. Um, for the past eight years, I've been working in various capacities with Amnesty International, and a year ago, we rallied outside the embassy in Washington, D.C., and delivered a few hundred letters, and it's incredible to see you here today. Um, I'm just, as a suggestion, I suppose, that sort of activism has for me been a way of channeling all of the anger and discontent that I've felt, whether in my own life or with my government. And I can only hope that that would be something helpful to young people in Burma. But I was wondering from your perspective, as somebody who has been on the posters of so many organizations and is someone who we learn about when we first start. What is your perspective on these groups and the effect that they have? I think what you said is very good. You must use your anger in a positive way by helping others. I've always said that people who are in despair would help themselves best by trying to help others. And it's, I mean, it's marvelous that you know that there is in anger and discontent inside you and that you've got to try to put this to good use. And by the way, let me say that you needn't uh, apologize about stumbling. I tend to do that too. And one of the, the results of long years under isolation is that in a way, I forgot how to speak fluently. And even now, when I'm tired, I cannot get my words and sentences together. This is a result of long years of not having conversations with other people. So please don't uh, apologize about the stumbling. And thank you for what you did for Burma. It did matter. I never received a single letter that the uh, members of Amnesty International sent me. These letters were not allowed to get through to me. But I knew that they had been written, and I appreciated it. Uh, my name is David Abrahamson. I'm a second year student at the School of International Public Affairs. Uh, my wife and I had the pleasure of visiting your country in February of 2011 as part of our honeymoon and we had a delightful time. We even drove by your house. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> you were there, but so it's an honor to see you in person now. Uh, myself and a lot of my classmates are really interested in working in international nonprofits after our studies. What do you think are one or two areas that international nonprofits can make the biggest contribution to Burma and Burma's people? Uh, you, anything to do with law? Um, myself, a little bit. Oh, my friends, because of course there are lots and lots of uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, but as the chairman of the Committee for the Rule of Law and Tranquility, and both much needed in Burma, I would very much like help with improving the ability of our young lawyers. Uh, the study of law, like other um, branches of, um, of, of, of academic life in Burma, suffered during the years under the military regime. And we need good lawyers. We need all kinds of educated people. For example, I need a speech writer. Now, I think if our young people had been better educated, I wouldn't have to write to all my speeches. I could just get one of them to write them for me. So we need so much help to bring our young people up to the standard uh, of, uh, that, that has been achieved in other countries. So again, I would say, please get together with your friends and put together a suggestion 
as to what kind of help you would like to give. And uh, please contact the NLD. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dasu, there are many good writers in this room. Ah, oh, shall I, I adver you know. advertise for a speech writer? <laughs> <laughs> but you won't get a salary. <laughs> Minglava. Minglava. Okay. Uh, my name is Wei Yi Kain. Um, I'm a first year graduate student in the Mailman School of Public Health, um, focusing on health policy in a global context. And, you know, my passion, like Jaw, is also to return to Burma one day and, you know, possibly do a positive impact. Now, in your opening statement, you opened the floor up and asked us for advice or suggestions. And well, one of my professors here at Columbia said the best way to answer a question is with a question. So um, my question is, what do you see the role of students who are studying abroad, you know, be it the United States, be it the UK, and even in Southeast Asia, in terms of when we re-enter the country, can we do so in a tactful manner so that we're in a position to actually make these type of impacts? And I also have a follow-up question is, what do you see as the role of academic institutions, such as Columbia, other academic institutions, in helping Burma develop and grow? Young people who have been educated abroad have much to offer Burma, but they have to know how to do it, and they have to find out where they can be of best use. Some who have been educated away from Burma have grown away from not just f from the country itself, but from the way in which our people react and from the mm -hmm. way in which our people think. Now, of course, there's also the question of language. Mm -hmm. If you still speak Burmese well, that's no problem. But a lot of young people who have been educated abroad, uh, well, I'll have to put this quite frankly, choose not to speak Burmese well. And that I've never liked. I do not think that you should take pride in forgetting your native language. Uh, you can take pride in mastering a foreign language, but that does not mean that you have to forget your own language. So if you really want to come back and help Burma, you must do it with a sense of humility, grateful for the opportunity to serve, grateful that you are able to give what others cannot give. I think that's a great necessity because the Burmese are a proud people. The fact that they are poor, the fact that they are uneducated, does not mean that they like being treated as poor, uneducated people. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, you did mention the word tact. I think you'll need a lot of it. And uh, academic institutions. We, uh, we are in the process of drawing up a university education law in the legislature. And when that law has been drafted and adopted. We hope that it will make our universities more open, more progressive, and then they will be more in need of contacts with universities abroad that they might be able to raise their standard of teaching as quickly as possible. In the meantime, of course, you could always offer scholarships to some of our best students in Burma. But I would like to make a point that we have very good students who are, who are intelligent and who are hardworking, but who do not know enough English, whose English is very poor. And I would like to appeal to universities who are thinking of offering scholarships to our young people to consider giving them an intensive language course for, say, three, four months before bringing them in into an undergraduate program. This sort of thing is done in countries like Japan, for example. They have taken, uh, given scholarships to young people from Burma. They put them in a language school for several months. And after that, these students are ready to join the regular program of the universities. Good afternoon. It's an honor to speak with you. I'm Julian Hector, engineering class of 2010. Now, my first experience with Burma was with a former, um, former classmate in high school about 10 years ago. 
And her father was a doctor who had left Burma because of the situation near the politics and just the economic situation. And I've met, I've met many more Burmese since then in college. One was a roommate of mine. And beyond just the politics, one of their biggest frustrations was with the economics in the country. You know, obviously you know, the sanctions have contributed to that, but they often felt powerless to, to help in any way. What specifically would you recommend to students, to people in the Burmese diaspora, um, as far as helping, to, helping your, your country to grow economically? Uh, the people in the Burmese diaspora, first they must decide for themselves whether they want to go back to Burma or not. You can help Burma even if you don't go back there. There are other ways of helping. For example, you can help students who've come abroad to study. You can help refugees. You can help by uh, donating to uh, organizations helping with humanitarian work. There are many ways you can help. You don't have to go back to the country. But if you decide to go back to the country, then as I was saying earlier, you've got to, to make up your mind as to where and how you want to help. So first of all, if you are settled here, I would like to say to those Burmese who have settled here, you don't have to be ashamed of it. You, you don't have to feel guilty about it. You can help if you want to. And I always say, even if you do not want to help Burma, as long as you are a good citizen of this country, I'm satisfied because at least you would be a credit to our country. We can say that this marvelous person comes from Burma and even if he or she is not able or, or not for, others, for some reason or the other willing to engage again with Burma, I will be satisfied. People have the right to choose their own lives and they must not live with the feeling that they're obliged to help. But of course, if they would help, I'd be very happy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Swara Saleh. I am a junior at Columbia College. A few days ago, in an interview with Christian Amanpour, you said you have a soft spot for the military generals. I'm wondering if you could explain that comment and explain the insurmountable moral courage you had to say that, and if you could give us advice as students on how to deal with people on the opposing side. Well, I'm in a very unusual position because my father was the founder of the Burmese army. And uh, my first memories of my father are of him in uniform. In, in the photographs, I don't remember him because I was only two when he died. But uh, most of the photogra photographs we had of him around the house showed him in uniform. And of course, I was brought up uh, uh, to understand that he was the father of the Burmese army. And the soldiers uh, of the army used to refer to him as their father. And in fact, when I was growing up, ordinary soldiers, complete strangers, would address my mother as mother. So I, get, I grew up with the feeling that I was part of the army family. And of course, there were also my father's old soldiers who were always coming and going. Uh, because of that, I could never really hate the, the generals, although I hated what they were doing. And because of my father, I do have a soft spot for men in Burmese military uniform. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, learning, le learning not to hate, I was speaking uh, just this morning to some uh, of Burmese Americans, and I made the point that hate and fear are linked together. And when you hate somebody, you must really ask yourself why and you will find that it is because you fear that he may hurt you in some way, he or she. I do not think you can actually hate anybody unless you have this fear, the fear that he or she will be able to hurt you, may be able to hurt you in some way. So if you want to get over your hate, you must get over your fear first. Thank you so much. And how do you get over your fear? How do I get over my fear? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a, a practical way I got over my fear of the dark. When I was small, I was very afraid of the dark. 
I was terrible. Whenever we went into a room at night, I, somebody had to go in front of me, and I would bury my face in that person's back and say, put on the light, put on the light, put on the light. <laughs> and until the light had been switched on, I wouldn't open my eyes. I was that afraid of the dark. I was afraid of ghosts, and I thought that ghosts lurked in the dark. And my mother was very disapproving because uh, she was a brave woman, and she didn't like the fact that um, I, I was so uh, I, 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 I was so cowardly. And I got tired of it. I got tired of this fear. I got tired of the fact that I was frightened every time I went into a dark room. So one day when I was about um, 11, I suppose, I thought this is about enough. You know, I, was, I had to, to stop this. And I found a very simple way of doing it. Our house is a two-story house. And my mother used to make us drink uh, a hot cup of milk every night, a, a nightcap. Uh, and this would be made for us in the dining room. We'd have it, and then we'd go upstairs, and everybody would go upstairs. So I would say to my mother, this milk is too hot. I can't drink it yet. And I would leave it downstairs. And then we would all go upstairs. And after everybody was upstairs and downstairs was in complete darkness, I would say, I'm going down for my milk. And I would come down. And, uh, and of course, I would have to find my way to the dining room and there, through the dark rooms, put the light on and have my milk all alone in this dark downstairs and then switch off the light and find my way back up again. It was terrible for just about 10 days and after that, finish. <laughs> so you have to face your fears. That's the only way you get rid of them. My name is Hunter McDonald. I'm a first-year student at Columbia Business School. And in fact, when I was 11 years old, I had dinner in Scotland with your husband, Michael Harris, and he spoke so fondly of you and with such great hope. And it's just incredible to see you here now in New York and have it come full circle. But um, as a business school student, I, I have a business-related question. And my perhaps uninformed perspective of Burma at this point is that due to its isolation, um, its level of economic development and business involvement is sort of a, a blank canvas. And you spoke of uh, a potential for a human resource curse. And I'm interested in hearing your perspective on moving forward, um, how you'd like to envision an economy in Burma that both involves its young people without alienating the business incumbents and where you see that evolving moving forward? Well, I'm starting by encouraging what I call democracy and human rights friendly investment. Uh, we would like the, the kind of businesses which care about the environment, which care about the, their, um, their laborers, their workers, and uh, which, uh, which engage in outreach programs. And also, I, um, I'm very interested in what I call 20th, 21st century agriculture business because food security is going to be a greater and greater concern. And I want our agriculture, everything of course is in ruins in Burma, including the agricultural sector, which gives us a chance to bring a build, build everything up from scratch. So if you're in business, I would like you to see how best we might develop our agricultural sector so it's in line with the future rather than the past. Don't forget that the 20th century is now the past. And yet a lot of businesses operating now are still 20th century style. And yet we are one decade, well, into the second decade of the 21st century. So that's how you can help us. Think how we can make agriculture a 21st century business, keeping in mind that there will be a growing need for more and more food in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Dawson, I'm Theo Milanopoulos. I'm currently a first year PhD student in political science, um, but if you're still accepting speech writing applications, that might change. <laughs> um, it, it appears to me that uh, Burma's transition to democracy has been relatively peaceful compared to the chaos and violence that greets such transitions um, today in other parts of the world, most prominently Syria. 
What role does violent resistance play in transitions toward democracy? And can it ever be a, a legitimate means to a democratic end? Well, I think it should always be the means to a democratic end because I believe that means cannot be divorced from ends. If the means are not right, then you will distort the end itself. The very goal that you set out to achieve will become distorted if you use means that are contrary to the principles on which you should base that goal. Um, the, the, you said that Burma's transition to democracy has been relatively peaceful. I don't think we can put it quite like that because don't forget that the transition began in 1988, not in 2010, because we fell under military dictatorship in 1962, and 1988 was a great uprising against what they then called uh, one-party rule, which was dominated by the military or ex-members of the military. So that was put down very violently. And then, of course, there was the 2007 Saffron Revolution, when the monks uh, led nonviolent non demonstrations and were also put down brutally. So we can't really say that the transition to, Burmese, to democracy in Burma has been free of violence. But certainly, uh, my party, the National League for Democracy, always held to the principle of non-violence. This was not always the case with all the other forces for democracy. We were the ones who started out by saying we have to use non-violent means and we kept to that or in spite of the tremendous oppression we suffered. So I think not only does non-violence work, it can be made to work and it should be the only way to democracy if you want that democracy to be the kind that is not warped by the road of violence. Thank you. So we are um, beginning to see uh, the clock is ticking and there are so many who want to ask questions. So let's see if we can ask very brief questions and see if we have some brief answers Kay. and see how many we can get through. Um, my name is Keisuke Kitamura. I'm second, a second year student at the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, I, I'm, I grew up in Japan and I'm happy that you mentioned the research you work in Kyoto University that I'm graduate from. And uh, my, my question is, sorry, uh, I was working for United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs in Asia and I, through my research, about the, the insurgency groups of Burma, I was shocked that there were so many insurgency groups. And my question is, how will you work for the security and the unification of Burma? Because there are so many different groups have different opinions. At the moment, of course, there are peace talks going on between the government and various ethnic groups. This will take time. Uh, there are always two sides to demands of uh, minority groups. It's, one is to do with uh, development and humanitarian issues and the other is to do with the identity and we've got to address both issues if we are to resolve the problem in the long run. Thank you. Good afternoon, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm Shan Cho, a first year student of Columbia College. I come from a very large country near Burma, China. <laughs> And uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you because back to your previous comments, you say that uh, the sort of not so good relationship between China and Burma is not only caused by some government issues, but also some individual businessmen in Burma, which inspired me to go to Burma in the next summer holiday. And then comes my question. Several months ago, I was watching a movie about you, the lady, and there's a scene which impressed me a lot. Um, there's a lot of young people in the movie, they're helping you to launch the political campaign, but at the same time, a lot of them were caught by the government and they were brut brutally killed by the government. I was so terrified and delusioned because they're so passionate, but they're so powerless in face of the dictatorship. So my question is that, what do you think is the best time for the young people to participate in politics, whether when they're very young 
or reckless or when they are very mature but sometimes conservative, especially for those come from the country with certain extent of dictatorship. Thank you. When they're young and restless, you can't keep them out of politics anyway. <laughs> They'll do it if they want to. But I, these young people go, grow to be mature adults. And in my country, they, uh, in my party, there are many who came to us in their early 20s and who are still with us now in their 40s, now as mature members of the party, because they've remained true to our cause. If you believe in the cause for which you are working, no age is the wrong age. Every age is right. Some of our party members started out in the 70s. So every age is right if you're dedicated. Hi, my name, <clears throat> my name is Tim. I'm a junior in Columbia College. I was also born and raised in China, so a lot of what you said struck me because um, those things do still apply to China today, such as the lack of a free press and uh, barely functional legal system. Um, and that is one of my dreams. I guess it's my dream to change that. However, um, the Chinese system is highly complicated and sophisticated in terms of deterring activists and um, dis dissidents. And I'm wondering whether you think democracy is the ultimate solution to situations like China and uh, what can students like me do? Because by virtually being here, I'm blocked from a lot of the ways to bring up substantial changes within the system. It is for the people to decide what system they want. And in Burma, the people did choose democracy. In 1988, the people were demonstrating for multi-party democracy because we had been under one-party dictatorship for so long. So in the end, it's the people who decide. I decided to work for the cause for democracy because I believed in it. As I said earlier, I grew up in a democratic Burma. And by the time dictatorship came to Burma, I was in other uh, democratic countries, in India first, and then in England, in the States, and so on. So I believed in democracy. You can only achieve something that you really believe in. So your people must decide. Uh, I believe in democracy, but I cannot say to other people, this is what you must believe in, this is what you must go for. It is for you to decide what would best suit your country. And you, as an individual, has the right to think what might be the right answer. Thank you. You can only achieve what you really believe in. That's a, that's a terrific thing to remember. I'm so sorry to say that we are out of time for questions, but uh, let me do this. What is the email address where people might apply the for other, a job as a speechwriter? Well, you can give it to me and I can yes. read it out loud. And, or uh, by the way, I, I think I must say that Ziyato, who is our youngest MP, uh, is also a hip hopper and an ex prisoner of conscience. <laughs> Too bad we don't have much time, otherwise I could have made him sing for you. <laughs> While um, they're looking for the email address, um, let me also just simply say that behind every great woman, uh, such as Aung San Suu Kyi, there is a fantastic team. And if it would be acceptable to you, of course. might you all stand, the team of Aung San Suu Kyi, please stand and be recognized for your support. And you well. Stand up. Let could I say j just a few words about them? Uh, this, uh, I, I keep calling him Bunny and I can never remember his real name. Anyway, Bunny, who is standing this side, came to me in 1988 as a young student of about 18 or 19. And here he is still with us. And Ziyato in the, in the middle is our youngest MP, as I said earlier. He is a hip hopper. He was uh, a prisoner of conscience for several years and released just before I was released. And at the end is Dr. Timao, my personal assistant. Now, uh, she's unique because she was working for UNICEF for many years and getting an, an excellent salary. And I said to her last year, you'd better leave your job. I can't pay you anything, but you'd better come to work for me. And she did. <laughs> so since mo the most of you here are students, uh, I hope that you have a piece of paper 
and so that someone, and if you don't, then you can, or, and a pen, and if so someone is with you, maybe they, you can share this. The email address is info dot nld burma at gmail dot com. I'm going to repeat it. Info dot nld burma at gmail dot com. Thank you for your wonderful questions. This has been a really wonderful audience. I'm so sorry we can't get to any more questions, but I do uh, want. Would you like to write to down your questions and send them to uh, to that email address? If you email your questions to this address, she'll answer you. Let me just, however, take just two more minutes, which is all we have left, to allow Dao Su to make some closing remarks about her thoughts. I, I hope your answers, you've gotten some answers uh, from these students. Yes, and I'm very happy that there are so many of you who want to ask questions because if you have lived under a dictatorship for a long time, you forget how to ask questions. You just do everything that you're told to do. And the fact that so many of you are coming up wanting to ask questions means that you do not live under a dictatorship. I'm very glad to find that out. And please do email your questions to me. I will not be able to send replies to them immediately because uh, this email, of course, is uh, uh, that of our office in Burma. I'll be in the States until the 4th and then I go back to Burma and I would not be able to pick up your quest questions immediately. There are probably other things I have to do first, but you will get answers to them. Make sure that you say that you're, you were uh, one of those at Columbia University on the 23rd of September. Thank you. Um, I think maybe an email from Aung San Suu Kyi might be worth not having had an opportunity to answer your question here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank now, you. Aung San Suu Kyi. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats as we escort the speakers out of the building first. Thank you.